Weber Basin Water Conservancy District. Hi, I'm Brooke Henderson. And I'm Corinne Hoffman. And we are your tour guides for your Weber Basin Water Conservancy District field trip today. We provide the water for around 700,000 residents of Davis, Weber, and parts of Morgan, Summit, and Box Elder counties. So we're gonna take a look at the map that shows the different areas where we get, the different watersheds where we get our water. And we have Willard Bay, Pine View Reservoir, Causey Reservoir, Lost Creek, East Canyon, Echo, Rockport, and Smith and Morehouse. Here at the water treatment plant, we have a five-step process that we use to clean the water. The process that we start with is coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, and disinfection. We're gonna head over to our chemical building where we will start teaching you about that treatment process. Welcome to the chemical building. This building is where we store all of the chemicals that we use throughout the process. We're gonna start with one of the most important chemicals we use, and that's sodium hypochlorite. You probably also know that as bleach. So it's the same stuff that you use at home to clean. We actually make it here in-house. We use a process called electrolysis. The liquid in this tank is called brine. That's a fancy word for salt water. We run it through this machine and use the electricity in that machine to separate out the chemicals. And that leaves us with a byproduct and sodium hypochlorite, which is chlorine. Okay, so we have the orange pipe and it goes into this tank, which is ferric chloride. We have two tanks that hold the ferric chloride. That's added to the water at the beginning of the treatment process. And it helps the water um, coagulate which means all of that organic matter that's in the water, if there's any dirt, any like leaves or sticks or debris of any kind, that will all start to bind together. Here is the polymer that we add to the water when we add the ferric chloride. It is positively charged and when we add it to the water, it attracts to the negatively charged molecules that are in the water and the flocculation process starts to happen more quickly. To measure the cleanliness of the water, it's measured in turbidity. And what we do to measure that is we shine a light in the water at 90 degrees and what reflects through is the turbidity. So this bottle right here, it shows pretty dirty water. This is usually what we have runoff um, after a wildfire or a rainstorm. When the water comes to our facility, it is about this dirty or clean and that is at five turbidity. And then our EPA standard is to have the water at 0.3 intrabidity and the EPA regulates our facility. They tell us how clean the water has to get but our goal is to actually get it to 0 0.03 intrabidity. So we're going to get it even cleaner than what the EPA is regulating us. So as we leave the chemical building you'll notice this pipe. This is the raw water that comes into the facility. It's the water that's coming from the reservoirs. It is our raw water because it has not been cleaned yet. And now we're going to head outside and see the beginning of the coagulation and flocculation process. This is our carbon silo and it is used to remove a bad taste or odor from the water from organic matter and it's only used a few times a year when the water quality demands that we need to use it. Our step of coagulation has already happened right outside of the chemical building and then the water is sent out here into our sedimentation basins and our flocculation basins. These basins are 12 feet deep, so there's a lot of water in these basins. This first basin is our flocculation basin. So the white particles in the water, if you look closely, that is the flock, and that's what's gonna start settling to the bottom of the basin. And then be scraped from the basin, and then the water will continue to flow down to the sedimentation part of the basin. And then the orange particles on the top is the ferric chloride and the polymer mixed with organic matter, and that's what's floating on top of the water. Here at the beginning of our sedimentation basin, we have drags and chains that will slowly scrape the sludge off of the bottom of the basin. And as that happens, that sludge is gonna be sent over to our thickening basins on the west side of the facility. And you'll notice as we walk along this basin, the water is going to get clearer and clearer. So it starts out a little dirtier over on this edge, and as we get to the end, it just gets more and more clear and you can see more easily down to the bottom of the basin. And this basin is also 12 feet deep. 
and it's just big, wide and open. There are no walls or impediments to it. This is the north end of the sedimentation basin and all of the dirtier water and the finer particles are settling down to the bottom. As the water flows through the basin, it goes over the edge and it's sent into a pipe that takes the water into our filtration building. As a reminder, we clean about 46 million gallons of water a day. As you can see, these can get pretty dirty. So we have to clean them out seasonally. We clean them out every fall and every spring. We empty them out, we scrub the walls down, check for leaks and make sure they're squeaky clean so that when we bring the water back in, we're getting it cleaner. Now we're gonna go into our lab and this is where we test the water. We have different operators that will go out in the field and they'll take samples of water. And they bring it back to our lab every day to make sure that the water is clean and safe for everyone to drink. We test metals in water, we test bacteria, and anions and cations, and quite a few other tests uh, having to do with water quality. This is the bacteriological testing bench, and here we test for total coliform bacteria and also E. coli bacteria. And so, for example, these tests were ran yesterday. This came back clean for both total coliform and E. coli. And this test came back positive, it turns yellow. And when it's, uh, when it's positive for total coliform, we'll go and shine some UV light on it. And if it glows blue, then that means it's also positive for E. coli, which is obviously not good. So, and at that point, then specific measures are taken to to try and clean the well or the water system, whatever is positive for that bacteria. Okay, so this is our ion chr chromatography bench. And this is the machine that we use to, to read for the ions, and that would mean cations and anions, which cation is a positively charged particle and an, and an anion is negatively charged. And so those show up on the computer as different peaks here. So depending on the size and the location of the peak, you can tell how much of any given ion is in your water. After the water goes from the sedimentation basin, it's going to come into our filtration building. And the first thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna go through the ozone chamber and then it's gonna go into our filter. I am standing in front of what's called an ozone generator. So as the water comes in through the pipes, it comes first here. Now ozone, is three molecules of oxygen. One thing ozone or oxygen does not like is being in groups of three. So the minute that water runs through, those oxygen molecules break up and try to find something else to latch onto. So generally, two oxygen molecules will stay together and we'll have that free radical oxygen molecule looking around and it's looking for something to grab onto. So that oxygen molecule will grab onto the viruses and the bacteria that are in the water. And this is a very fast process. And so it will kill a lot of the bacteria and viruses. And if it doesn't kill them, it weakens them. This is a scale model of our filter. The top layer is 30 inches of anthracite and the bottom layer is 15 inches of sand. And then at the bottom of the filter, we have this nozzle where the water flows through and it goes into the pipes underneath the filtration building, and then it goes into our disinfection stage. Here at our filters, the water is actually flowing down through the top of the filter. At some point, the filters are gonna be really dirty, just like any filter that we have at our home. So we need to clean them, and we do that through a process called backwash. What happens is water and air is pushed through the bottom of the filter up towards the top, and as that happens, it's cleaning the filters, and it's getting rid of all the debris and any organic matter that's left in the filters and it's cleaning them and as it comes out it looks like chocolate milk. The dirty water that's pushed out is sent over into our thickening basins on the west side of the facility. The filters need to be backwashed every 40 to 100 hours. We have now walked down a flight of stairs. This wall behind me is where the filters are. So we're in front of and below the filters that we just saw. This is the end of the filtration process. This right here is a monitor that shows the turbidity after it's gone through the filter process. That Environmental Protection Agency benchmark for us is 0.30, so we've handily met that. 
So we have really clean water that has come through this filter. Okay, we're at the fifth step of our water cleaning process. And we add chlorine to the water, and the water then goes through our UV reactors. This yellow pipe is chlorine that we add to the water, and it just makes sure the water is clear, um, so you can't see anything in it, so it's more pleasant to drink. These reactors that you see right by me are the UV reactors. Each one of them holds 72 of these UV lights. As the water flows through these reactors, the UV lights will shine the UV light into the water and it will disable the cryptosporidium bacteria that's left in the water and disable it so it can't reproduce anymore. And now the water is clean and ready for you to drink. So we will send it out to the different cities that we serve. So after we've cleaned the water, we're going to add fluoride to the water for Davis County and not Weber County. And that is added at different distribution sites throughout the valley, not here at our facility. We are regulated by the EPA and water bottle companies are regulated by the FDA. We are a water wholesaler, so the water that we clean for you is much, much cheaper than buying this small bottle of water at a convenience store or the grocery store. These are our thickening basins where all the solids are sent. The solids will settle to the bottom, a little bit of water evaporates and the rest of the water is sent to be treated again through the facility and then once the solids are dry enough, they're sent into different landfills around the area. Right now, I am standing on top of a one million gallon storage tank. This is where we store the water before it gets sent out to the different cities. So that's clean water underneath here. This is a special area of the garden. This is the Weber Basin Learning Garden. It's open to the public from 8.30 to 4. You can come and wander around with your families. Some great things about this garden is that everything here is meant to teach about water conservation and plant care. So it's a great place to come if you want to look for ideas for your own garden at home. Most everything is labeled. If it's not labeled in one area, walk around. It's probably labeled in another. So you can find plants that are going to work in your garden. We know that everything in this garden grows in Davis County you can grow those same plants in your home. Here on our water tank, we only water the plants a few times a year based on their water needs. We recommend that you plant plants together that have similar water needs. This is our low water area or our xeric area. So if you look in this garden, you'll see the black tubing. That's from a drip watering system. It actually only delivers water to the roots of the plants that we actually want to live. We also use mulches. Here we're using gravel as a mulch. In other areas you'll notice that we use wood. If you have a good layer of mulch, about two to three inches, that keeps your groundwater down underneath. We don't lose nearly as much to evaporation and that way we don't have to water as much either. This area is a demonstration of raised garden beds. The raised garden beds can be for water conservation because when we're watering in the raised garden beds, we do not have to water the ground around it. We also use our drip watering system in here so that we make sure that the water is going just to the roots of the plant and we don't have to worry about broadcast spreading. When we do the broadcast sprinklers, you lose a lot to evaporation and you also put water where you don't want it. So you're also going to cut back on your maintenance. You're not giving water to the weeds. So you get a good layer of two to three inches of mulch. You're also not going to have as many weeds come up through there. You're going to keep that groundwater down where we want it. It keeps the roots cooler too. So our plants are a lot happier. You won't see a lot of bare ground around here. Here in our demonstration garden, this is an example of what a backyard could be like. But you'll notice that we have a lot of planting area. All of the plants we plant here use the same water needs. And we encourage you to use more plants in your landscape than to have more grass. 65 to 70% of municipal water is used in landscapes and most of that is used on turf. Here is our front yard demonstration. And as you can see, we have a paver pathway to the front door. That is another great way, if you don't want to have a cement sidewalk, to incorporate natural landscaping and not have to use as much turf. And here we have our dried river bed with a nice bridge over it. These are just different landscaping ideas that you can do in your yard and give ideas to your family if, you're hap if you happen to be re-landscaping. As you walk through, there's a nice fire pit and a pergola back behind me. Okay, so here we're at our mulch display and we have 
a variety of rock displays up here. Those are inorganic mulches. They don't break down in the soil. Where back here we have bark. And what happens when you put three to four inches of bark in your flower garden, um, your vegetable garden even, and in any of your planting areas, that mulch is gonna break down and as it does that, it's put, putting nutrients back into the soil and that's very important for any landscape or garden area. And now we wanna talk grass. In Utah, we love to plant cool weather plants. Cool weather grasses, this is Kentucky bluegrass. So this Kentucky bluegrass looks awesome in the spring and in the fall. And the reason it looks awesome in, in the spring and in the fall and everybody thinks they're doing a great job with their lawn is because the temperatures are cooler. That's what it likes. So in the summer, this grass will naturally kind of die down and go yellowish because it doesn't like the heat. So we pump even more water on it to keep it artificially green. That's not normally a problem if we're doing it well. So the problem is we normally put two times as much water as it needs. So we're wasting an enormous amount of water on our lawns. Some things we can do is we can call Weaver Basin Water Conservancy District and they will send out auditors free of charge to your house. They'll take a look at your sprinkling system, they'll take a look at your soil, and they'll help you draft a plan that lets you know exactly how much water you need for your lawn and each different station to keep it healthy and its optimum and with maximum water efficiency so that we're not just pouring so much water on that is unnecessary. Extra watering can also cause problems like funguses in your things, you can get the mushrooms, you can get different infections from it too. Another thing that we can do is we can water at appropriate times. They have asked residential customers to not water between the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. And the reason why is that's when we lose most of our water from evaporation. So these are our warm weather grasses, so they're going to be more naturally green during the summer. They will go dormant during the winter. So when it starts to get cooler, these will go dormant, just like our Kentucky bluegrass likes to go dormant in the summer. But these are much less water use. So this is buffalo grass here, and this is dog tuft grass here. These also don't tend to grow as high, so you're not gonna have to mow as often either. So these are warm weather grasses. You can come, please come and take a look at the different grasses that we have here at Weber Basin Water. And again, please use our services to water wisely. Thank you for coming on your tour here at Weber Basin Water Conservancy District. We hope you've learned something about your drinking water and we hope you come to visit our gardens.